Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Welcome. Uh, today I'm going to talk about everything related to cause and effect estimation. And I'll first start by giving an introduction of motivation behind the entire idea and talk about randomized controlled trials and observation versus interventional data. Then I'll give an overview of all the different treatment effects that exist in the literature. And then afterwards, I'll explain how to actually estimate those using things like the backdoor criterion, front door criterion, propensity score matching, instrument arrival, and so on. And then I'll finish by conclusions and some open research questions. And um, before I start, it's probably best to ask any questions you might have at the end of every section, but there will be uh, plenty of time at the, at the very end to ask uh, questions as well. So, right. The main question we want to answer here is what is the causal effect of a particular action or decision? Um, one of the key questions in life, really. Um, but just to give you uh, an example of a naive approach upon how one might answer this or how it might have been done in the past, uh, we might want to run a new marketing campaign, for instance, if we were a marketing company. And then uh, we could observe a change in revenue from that. Uh, running that campaign, and then perhaps estimate the effect the campaign had from historical data. So we might be running a Christmas campaign this year, and we see uh, an up in revenue, and then we compare it to our Christmas campaign we ran last year. But that kind of approach obviously doesn't take into account that the environment might have changed from the new or from the old marketing campaign to the new marketing campaign, and that might have had some un some nonlinear effect that might bias the effect that we estimate from the historical data. Or this campaign um, this year might have been applied or biased towards a particular group of people different to last year. And that's obviously going to be biased. If this year our um, campaign happens to be uh, run on younger people between 20 and 30, but last year it was mostly between uh, to people between 30 and 40, that obviously has an, has an impact on the effect that we estimate. And this is where randomized controlled trials comes in. One of the many reasons it was uh, developed, but among many others. Um, RCTs, also known as A-B tests, those two things are actually the same, if you, don't, if you didn't know before. They aim to control for confounding relationships and environment changes. And the way they do it is by basically specifying a treatment group, which consists of individuals who received the treatment, so received a particular product maybe, and the control group, which are those individuals who did not receive a treatment or product. And our RCTs must ensure that the treatment group and control groups have overall similar covariate distributions. So that means, for instance, the age distribution across the treatment and control group should be similar, or the income, education, and uh, wealth distribution should be similar as well. And given that, we can estimate an unbiased effect that um, deploying product, for instance, has. Just to give you a more concrete example, say um, we want to introduce a new product A and we're already running product B in our pipeline. We then would apply each of these products to a different group. So product A applied to the treatment group, product B applied to the control group. And here it's important that the covariate distributions are very similar across these two groups. And then we would simply observe the average outcome of our response variable in the first group, in the treatment group, and do the same in our control group. And then really the causal effect is simply the difference between those two average responses. That's pretty easy, right? Now, while these RCTs and A-B tests work extremely well in practice and have been the gold standards for de decades, oftentimes you can't actually run them. And there are many reasons for that. For instance, they may be lethal or dangerous in healthcare. Um, it's a real issue. People, you can't just uh, decide to give one cancer patient cancer treatment and not give the other patient cancer treatment. Um, they may be expensive, so oftentimes you have to deploy your product to thousands of people, which can be very expensive. There may be unknown adverse effects, so you don't know a priori if the product you're deploying actually has a positive effect on, on whatever group you're deploying it to. You might actually find that it has a negative effect, and then you have uh, opportunity cost that's lost, obviously. 
Um, lastly, you may not actually have control for all the covariates, so your distributions between the two groups might still be quite dissimilar, which obviously means that the causal effect you get from it might still be biased. So it's not the be all end all. Now, what's the solution to this? Um, since you're in this talk, you might have guessed it. It's causal effect estimation with observational studies or observational data. And before I go into that, I think I need to explain what the difference between interventional and observational studies are, because I do get asked that question a lot. Interventional studies are basically uh, basically involve making deliberate decisions about the treatments, as done, for instance, in randomized controlled trials. Observational studies, on the other hand, are concerned with observing the subject without ever interacting with it. To give you an example, I might want to answer the question, what is the effect of a good night's sleep on general health? And an interventional study to answer this question might involve assigning a treatment group where people sleep at least, at least eight hours a day and a control group where people sleep around five hours uh, a night. And then I would observe the health for a period of time. And obviously that's quite expensive because actually forcing people to sleep a certain hour, number of hours per night is pretty hard. Some people might be very adverse to sleeping five hours a night or maybe more than eight hours a night. An obs observation study in this respect is a lot easier because here we just passively observe the health of a group of people who sleep for a variety of hours. We don't actually need to force them to do anything at all. And whereas we get the causal effect directly from the interventional study, as I said before, we do need to do some post data collection correction for the observational study, which in essence we do by a positive inference and I'll talk about later. And I should also mention that the underlying causal graph of these two different types of studies are actually different. So for an interventional study, the causal graph would look like this. Because we've made sure that the uh, treatment group and the control group have the same covariate distribution, there's actually no causal error from the covariates to the treatment group. And that's because no matter the value of the treatment variable, the distribution of covariates will be the same. Now, this is different for an observational study where obviously for a given treatment value, the distribution of covariates will be different. So here there's a causal effect of the covariates to the treatment. Now, this is important because it means that interventional observational studies correspond to different causal graphs, which means we need to do different causal operations on them. Right. Now that was the kind of introduction and motivation. Does anyone have any questions so far now? Cool, so I'll go on and talk about treatment effects. Now treatment effects, as we all know, have actually a really long history in the natural sciences, social sciences, and economics, among many others, mainly because they allow us to estimate causal effects from interventional and observational studies, like I've already alluded to before. And when I talk about treatment effects, I also have to talk about the do operator, which um, I signify here by this uh, do t equals small case t. And this signifies performing an intervention, for instance, within an RCT, and thereby removing all causal drivers of the treatment variable. This is a mathematical operator, basically. And it's automatically applied in randomized controlled trials, but not in observational studies. And the cool thing about it is that we can go from a causal graph like this, a basic confounder graph, uh, apply the dual operator, and get to this causal graph on the right-hand side. And if you remember, the one on the left is the one corresponding to observational data. The one on the right is corresponding to interventional data. So that really allows us to go from observational to interventional data. And I will talk about how this works exactly mathematically later when I talk about estimation methods. But for now, I want to talk about all of the different treatment effects first, because they're also applicable to interventional studies. The first treatment effect I have to talk about is the average treatment effect, or the ATE for short. It's basically the most common treatment effect that you can find. And it's given simply by the average of one intervention minus the average of another intervention. So mathematically, I'd write it down as the expectation of our outcome variable 
given doing one intervention minus the expectation of the outcome variable, given doing another intervention. And I wanted to showcase uh, the different treatment effects on a set of data um, that I've generated with this confounding graph here, where people face a certain number of bugs per, per day or per month. And uh, depending on how many bucks they face, we give them a certain discount to their product or to their subscription, uh, which in turn then affects for how long or whether or not they renew their contract or their subscription at all. And of course, the number of bucks they see also has an effect on that. And when you generate the data with this causal graph, you get this nice kind of Simpsons paradox like causal graph that I'm sure many of you have seen before. And um, the key here is that for the ATE, we simply leverage all of the data. And if you were to simply use a correlation-based approach, approach like linear regression and then look at the regression weight, for instance, you'd find that actually across the whole data, your uh, regression weight would be negative. So you would actually find that, you know, as the data uh, seems to suggest that as you increase your discount, the renewal rate actually decreases, which of course doesn't make sense because you're basically giving the uh, people uh, a free product. So you'd expect the renewal rate uh, to increase. But of course, that's confounded because people with um, a higher discount will have also experienced more, more bugs, which, have, which, which of course will have led them to renew their subscription less. Um, in any case, that's the data. And for the ATE, we look at all of the data points to compute these expectations. And that's different for the conditional average treatment effect, or Kate. So the Kate is very similar to the A, ATE, but with the data conditioned on some covariance x. So the equation is the same, but in the conditioning set, I have another variable x. And this simply means you look at the only subset of the data that you got by conditioning on the data, slicing your data or whatever. Um, here, I particularly looked at the people that face no bugs at all. So bugs equals zero, those are the, the blue points here. And basically I compute the treatment effect for only those individuals here, for only that subgroup. And that's what the case does. Now, of course, I've done this for one group. I might as well just do it for all of the other subgroups in this data, which is what constitutes the heterogeneous treatment effect or HDE for short. So the HDE is basically just a set of cates for every subgroup in the conditioning variable. You can write it down mathematically like this, but importantly, it just means computing a treatment effect for every subgroup in the data. And you can create these subgroups through any kind of conditioning that you want. So it could be bugs phased, it could be, um, I could just be looking at discount higher than 40%, doesn't really matter. And then lastly, I have the individual treatment effect or the ITE for short, which um, really is just the effect of one intervention minus that of another intervention for one particular individual. Not average over the data set, but just for one row of the data set basically. And the equation for that is um, pretty simple. It's just the outcome given doing one intervention minus the outcome doing another intervention. The tricky bit here is that obviously an individual will have been assigned to either the treatment or the control group. The value, like if the treatment is binary, will either be one or zero. So you have one factual data set, but you don't actually have the data for the other intervention, the counterfactual data. So that's a tricky bit in estimating the ITE compared to the other ones. And I'll talk about how to do that later as well. But yeah, for the ITE, you simply look at one, one data point essentially and compute that effect for that individual. Right. Now computing these treatment effects for intervention st studies is actually really straightforward. Like I've, said, like I've shown earlier in the product A versus product B example, it's simply the difference between the outcomes from one group minus the outcome from another group. Um, and the, that's easy because we have access to the data from the treatment group and the control. And we know we've controlled for all the variables we need to control for. So RCTs directly yield intervention distributions, which I signify here by P of Y and X given doing one intervention. Whereas observational studies yield observational distributions, so the joint, the joint data, the joint distribution, P of Y and X and T. But what we really need to compute the expectations in the equations I showed earlier 
is that distribution here. So now the question is, how do we actually go from that observational distribution to the interventional distribution, which we need to compute all of the treatment effects? And the answer to that is causal inference and do calculus. And that's what I'll talk about next, unless anyone have any questions. I have a question from Jerry in the chat. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll state it. As you're kind of going through kind of the, the three segments on that, the particular plot chart that you were that you were talking about, and you mentioned that, hey, obviously you get to a point here where there's there's a definition of blue, orange, and red, but you mentioned that these could be arbitrary, right? You, you could define these or segment these any way you want, but it looks like there was a methodology by which these were segmented. For example, did we just arbitrarily pick bug zero, bug six, bugs 12, or is there a, is there a mathematical means to, to help define how to segment these, I guess is yeah. the question. Um, that's it. There isn't a mathematical means in this example. There is in general. Um, here in this example, um, the bugs only took three values, 0, 6, and 12. I see. So okay. I, so I it's defined in the problem. data. Yeah, sometimes it's defined in the data, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you make the data. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. Obviously, that plot was made for the convenience of this talk. Um, but other than that, normally, if you do uh, this kind of stuff, you might want to look at percentiles. Of if, if your data is continuous, your, your confounding variable, if that's continuous, you might want to look at um, yeah, percentiles of the data. You might be interested in one particular subgroup only. For like uh, the K, you might be considered in a combination of people that are between 20 and 30 and that have an income of, I don't know, so-and-so, right? And that will slice your data in a, in a different way. And that's very important because it, it really depends on your scientific goals, on your, on your aims and what you're trying to do. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. I had a quick question. So this is like a, a Simpsons paradox type situation where naively the relationship looks like one way, but in fact, it's another way. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, are there sort of general ways of diagnosing that this relationship you can see might in fact be the other way around if you condition on some stuff? I guess maybe the answer is to do the cause and inference stages. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Um, the answer to that is you should just use causal effects all the time. You shouldn't use anything else. Um, using my package. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert, yes. <laughs> um, so if you even if you have data like this and you don't um, condition on a certain subgroup using the um, K, you will still find that the ATE in this particular example will be positive and not negative. So you find that the correlation will be negative, but the ATE, the causal effect, will actually be positive. And that's because the ATE is essentially just the weight of that edge between discount to renewal. And um, intuitively, if you think about it, discount, uh, the more you increase discount, um, given that everything else is fixed, um, the more renewal increases as well. But, so again... Uh, so did that answer the question at all, or was it talking around it? No, 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 definitely. So I, I guess like um, I'm trying to think of lightweight diagnostics before sort of running the whole package. So in this case, the correlation being in a different direction to the ATE is a suggestion that maybe something funny is going on here and you need to use some causal inference. Yeah. yeah. I think visually as well, sometimes you can see it. It's not always as clear as, as it is on that graph, yeah. Yeah. but sometimes you can just kind of pick up the something's wrong just by plotting the scatter plot or yeah. um, splitting the data and then plotting again. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I've also worked with data where the conditional treatment effect is very different for different subgroups. So you might have that um, the slope of this subgroup, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, the slope of that subgroup, um, anyway, the slope of that subgroup might be very flat. Whereas the slope of uh, this subgroup might have been very sharply rising, right? And if that's the case, if you compute the ATE, the ATE will still be an average of the whole data set. So then you might find out that actually the slopes kind of cancel out of these subgroups. 
Um, so the ATE might be quite small, but actually the Kate or the heterogeneous effect might be quite large. So um, yeah, looking at the ATE or the just the plain causal effect may not always be enough to kind of um, explain your data. You might want to look uh, have a bit, bit more of a fine grained look, but that depend depends on on what type of data you're dealing with and what the causal graph is that you think um, might be the truth. Yeah. If you if you also want a quick and dirty way, James, you can just run partial correlation, uh, and where you're basically adding a bunch of stuff which should be in the set of covariates uh, in the partial correlation. And if you want a quick and dirty way as well, we can use group by uh, and run partial correlations within each uh, subsegment of the group by to get a sense of the conditional partial uh, correlation, which is a proxy for for the treatment effect to some extent. Yeah. Take care of that, but yeah. Sorry, did that answer your question, James? Yeah, that's great, thanks. I, th I think these are cool ideas for like uh, ways to motivate potential clients before they apply the full package. <laughs> it's all what I'm thinking. Yeah, uh, but yeah don't, don't take my synthetic data slides as uh, you know, um, sales collateral or necessary. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Um, cool. So if there are no more questions, I'll talk about the actual estimation methods, which um, are the most mathematical bits. Okay, cool. So as I've said just now, we can leverage causal inference to infer interventional distributions from observational data. And there are many tools actually that we can use to do this. Um, for instance, we might have the backdoor criterion or the front door criterion, which are arguably the most popular examples of, of cause effect estimation methods. And they allow us to compute uh, the AT, the Kate, and the HTE. But they also typically require us to use double machine learning, which I will briefly touch on. And there's also instrument variables, which of course many people will know because the most recent Nobel Prize in economics was won for that. Um, they can also compute the ATE, the Kate, and the HTE. And then lastly, we have propensity score matching, which of course Andrew gave a learning lunch about just recently. And they can compute all of the treatment effects I've talked about. So everything, including the ITE as well. Um, there are quite a few other estimation methods as well that I'm I'm not going to talk about, but these are kind of the main ways that people do it um, in the literature. Right, let's start with the backdoor criterion, the most popular um, way of doing it. And the backdoor criterion basically says that we can infer an intervention distribution if we have what's called an adjustment set. And that adjustment set needs to block all confounding paths or backdoor paths. And I'll explain in a bit what those what that means. But the backdoor criterion holds if all of the elements in that adjustment set block all of the backdoor paths from the treatment to the outcome Y. And the backdoor path is basically uh, a non-direct path to from the target, from the treatment to the outcome. So not the direct one, but a path going through some convoluted way, essentially. And then also um, no child of the treatment can actually be contained in the adjustment set. Now, once that is actually uh, satisfied, we can compute the intervention distribution with this equation. So I'm not gonna explain exactly how to derive this. It's not that complicated really, but I'm gonna spare you the maths. Um, the left-hand side is the intervention distribution that we need in order to compute the treatment effects. It's our outcome variable, the distribution of our outcome variable, given that we do one particular intervention. That's what we want, but we don't have it. The right-hand side, is the equation for getting there. And it's basically just a sum over everything in the adjustment set of the conditional distribution of y given s, so the adjustment set and the treatment, times the prior over the adjustment set. Now, these distributions are all observational, entirely observational. So you can just look at them from your data set, and then you simply sum over the adjustment set variables. It's a pretty simple um, equation, really. Um, but quite powerful because, again, the right-hand side is an entirely observational, but the left-hand side is entirely interventional. And of course, the key here is that 
we need to find an appropriate adjustment set in order to leverage that backdoor criterion. I'm going to give you a few examples of how to find these. We might have a basic confounder graph that I've shown you before already. Um, here, the adjustment set is simply the variable x. So s is simply, simply only contains x. And that is because the backdoor path goes from t over x to y. So here, t to y is a, is a direct path. We don't care about that now. Um, actually, we do because we want to estimate the, uh, the effect of that. But we want to look at the backdoor path. And the important bit is, again, that there, no child can be in the backdoor path or in the adjustment set. So that arrow needs to point towards the treatment effect. If it were to point the other way around, that wouldn't be a backdoor path at all. So that's a quite important distinction. And then, of course, if we have another confounding variable, say W, we need to include that in our adjustment set as well. So we need to control for W and X at the same time. Um, imagine if we have a more complicated graph, we might have um, confounding variables that are uh, correlated with each other as well. And here, it's sufficient actually to have either X or W in the adjustment set because conditioning on either of them will block the backdoor path. Think of it as just putting a stop to kind of some flow of water or something. You're just stopping information to flow from here to here. And you can do that by simply observing some of the nodes here. It's also okay, of course, to include both of them in the adjustment set. Theoretically, there's no difference at all. Practically, there will be a difference. And um, Yoya might tell me more about that in his, in his learning lunch. But- um, Which one's easier? Uh, practically, I don't know. Because it, okay. it depends on the on the problem mm -hmm. usually. Um, theoretically, it doesn't make any difference okay. at all. It depends on the type of data, distribution of data, and how many covariates you have, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and again, importantly, we shouldn't at all include the mediator variable here in our adjustment set because that's a child of the treatment. And that's actually one of the many fallacies that people in the past have done when they've done, say, randomized control trials, where they've tried to control for mediator variables as well. And that would hugely bias your result because you think that this is something you've controlled for, but it's actually blocking the flow of information from the treatment to the outcome. So you won't actually be able to measure the causal effect at all. That's uh, a lot of money wasted if you do that. Hey, wow. Stephen. Um, sorry oh. if this is a really dumb question. How does this differ from marginalizing the joint distribution? on the previous slide? How does it go from probability of, yeah, how does it go from probability of Y condition on T equals T? How do you get the do operator in that? What, what's the difference? Yeah, um, explaining that would involve me um, okay. deriving, yeah, sorry. <laughs> deriving the equations. No, no, that's that's fine. Um, all right. Uh, no, it's, it's all right, I, I can grab you offline. I, sorry, I didn't want to derail. I was just worried I'd missed something, that was all. No, 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 um, you, you didn't miss anything. Uh, basically, um, if we were to simply marginalize, so if we were to want to compute P of Y given T, not given yeah. two of yeah. D, uh, not given two of T equals something, um, then we would have here P of S given T as well. So the right. critical point is that T is missing here. And if you okay. remember the causal graph I showed you earlier, the Cause graph corresponding to the interventional study doesn't have an edge from the um, covariates to the to the treatments. Okay. It only yes. has edges between covariates outcome and treatment to outcome. And that's reflected in this equation as well. If you do have an edge, then you would have to um, include T as a conditioning variable here as well. But then the issue with that is that of course we know the causal error goes from the covariates to the treatment variable. And here we have P of S given T, which intuitively, at least from a causal perspective, doesn't make sense because how can um, we condition our covariates on the treatment when the causal flow of information goes from the covariates to the treatment? Um, but okay. that's basically how this is derived. And I can go into more detail later if you want. No, no, that's that's great. Thank you. 
Uh, great. So let's talk about the front door criterion, which is you know, the next step up from the back door criterion. The uh, front wait, door criterion. Stephen. Uh, before before you go ahead, I, I just want to I just wanted to spell out something here because since we have uh, a lot of people in pre-sales in the calls, and the number one question that they receive is related to your answer to David, which is uh, how does this differ from a Bayesian network, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because a Bayesian network doesn't necessarily take into account the direction of the arrows whenever they do the condition, right? Can, can you just spend uh, half a minute uh, uh, bringing up that point again? Sure. Um, actually, I can just look at this graph here. Applying the do operator basically removes this edge, right? So when I want to compute the distribution of y given due t, what I need to do is I have the dis conditional distributions for each of these edges, but then I need to simply delete that edge. And I can still apply all, the, all of the Bayesian inference tools I know on the other edges, but I will remove that edge. In Bayesian networks, the, the concept of a do operator doesn't exist really. So you can't just delete an edge in a Bayesian network because that edge doesn't re represent anything causal, really. And if you apply the do operator, you need to delete all the edges that are uh, from parents, basically, that are um, incoming causal, causal errors. So for a Bayesian network, the notion of a do operator doesn't make any sense. What you can compute in Bayesian networks are the conditional distributions. So you, you would be able to compute P of Y given T. And you can compute that quite easily using Bayesian inference because that's simply um, the marginal over um, P of Y um, given T and X, which um, you can write down here in exactly this form only with P of S just being P of S given T. So really, if you if you only look at the equation, the only difference will be that for the Bayesian network, we, you will have P of S given T, and here you will have just P of S. And that's a subtle difference, but it's a very important one because for the vector criterion, this will imply that there's no edge between the covariance and treatment, which is exactly how a randomized control trial would work. And for the Bayesian network, uh, that equation implies that there is an edge here. Did that make any more sense? Cool. Thank you very much, sir. In Bayesian networks, it's not directed, right? Like the, the relationship. It, it is directed, but uh, the right. direction doesn't have much meaning okay. at all. So it doesn't have any physical meaning, if that makes sense. Right, because the edges just represent probabilities. Conditional probabilities, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, the edge could be the other way around, but I could still do exactly the same stuff. With it. Right, yeah. Okay. yeah. Whereas, of course, in causal graphs, um, you would must enforce that the errors also follow the causal flow mm -hmm. information. Yeah. Yeah. If you watch my um, causality landscape learning lunch, I spend a bit more time on explaining the difference between Bayesian networks and causal graphs. Plotting your other learning yeah. lunch. <laughs> I got to get those YouTube videos. <laughs> um, great. If no one has any more questions, I'll go to the front of the And of course, there will be a discussion at the end, so I'm happy to answer any more questions as well then. Um, right. The front row criterion is a bit different because here we assume that we have an observable mediator variable. And once we, if we do have an observable mediator variable, we can actually completely ignore any confounders between the treatment and the outcome variable and only need to look at the mediator variable. And this is quite powerful actually, because we might have some covariates, some, some confounding variables that um, are either unknown or we know of them, but we can't observe them. So say you know that a variable has an effect on your outcome, but you can't actually observe it because you don't have the data for it or you don't have access to the data. And the trick to the front of criterion is that you can actually just use a mediated variable if you have it here that doesn't have any other incoming edges except from the treatment and simply compute the effect of T of M with ignoring the covariates. And I'm gonna present you with some equations again, but I'll skip the, the exact derivation. Um, 
The left hand side is again what we want to estimate the intervention distribution of P of Y given D of T. And this is actually just the marginal of P of Y, um, the marginal of P of Y and M uh, given M and D of T. So we can then simply marginalize over the values of M and um, do a few more operations until we get to this part on the, on the right hand side here. As I said, I'll, I'll skip the derivations for you for now. But we have a conditional distribution here of P of M given T. So this is kind of, this represents this edge here, this distribution on the left. And then we also have P of Y given du of M. So this represents this edge, but with the important difference that we have a du operator acting on M. And if you remember the backdoor criterion, there's actually a backdoor path here going from M to Y. And the backdoor path goes via T. So we can actually apply the backdoor criterion here with T, the treatment variable, as our sufficient adjustment set. So I can actually just plug in the equation for the backdoor criterion, which is this guy here. And I already have an equation for the intervention distribution, which only contains observational data. So there's no do operators in here at all. And there's no unknown covariates at all. The equation only contains M, T, and Y, nothing else. And that's quite, uh, quite powerful, actually, if you think about it, because you don't need to worry about all the things that you don't know that are affecting the results. You know exactly that you have these three variables and they're completely sufficient to explain the causal effect. You don't need to correct for any or control for any covariates at all. And that's a frontal criterion. Now, the frontal and vector criterion, both in practice, rely on something called double machine learning, which I'm sure you've heard us talk about quite a bit. Um, Claudia recently gave a learning lunch about it, and mm -hmm. there will be another learning lunch coming up for that. Sure, yours will be much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I won't spend too much time on it. I'll just give you an idea of how this works um, you know, in general. So double ML, of course, yields unbiased estimates of the causal effect uh, from the treatment to the outcome. This is what we want to estimate. Um, however, double ML typically also assumes that all the variables are continuous and that the edge between the treatment and the outcome is linear. There are extensions that don't make that assumptions. That assumption, those are quite complicated. I won't talk about them right now, but I can go into detail later again. Um, Right, so again, um, let's look at the basic confounder graph uh, that I'm showing here on the right-hand side. Um, here, the difference is that we assume that Y is given as a linear function of the treatment variable. And then the linear weight for this relationship, theta in this case, is actually exactly equal to the treatment, to the average treatment effect. So if we estimate this linear weight correctly, we also automatically get an estimate of the average treatment effect. And the way this works, the way double machine learning works in general, is that we first regress our treatment on the covariates, and then we save the residuals of that linear regression or general regression problem. Then we regress our outcome on the covariates, and we save those residuals as well. And then we simply perform linear regression between the residuals from the, from the one edge and the residuals from the other edge, and the linear regression coefficient from that problem is actually exactly equal to the linear weight theta, which also equals the average treatment effect. So that's quite a simple way of computing the, uh, the average treatment effect. Um, it's, a, it's a very unbiased estimate. If you were to simply do linear regression um, uh, between x, t, and, and the outcome variable, you would find that actually your linear weight will be very biased because that wouldn't take into account um, the effect that X has on T. Right, that's the most basic approach. There are many extensions to this as well, and you will hear about uh, more about that um, in the coming weeks or months. What's up? <laughs> George is making faces at me through the window, so sorry. <laughs> typical, typical George, typical George. Um, Right, I've also um, briefly talked about instrumental variables, which, um, required, which are required to be exogenous and correlated with the treatment. Um, 
Broadly speaking, they correspond to causal graphs like this, where we have variables that are coming into the treatment, but that have no other incoming edges. And if we have this type of causal graph, then actually we can compute the average treatment effect simply with this equation. So simply by computing the covariance between the instrument and the outcome variable over the covariance between our covariance x and the outcome variable y. It's quite a simple equation. There are quite a few other ways of estimating the ATE with instrumented variables, but that's one of the most popular and easiest ways of doing so. And of course, that's uh, only using observational data on the right-hand side, and the left-hand side relies on interventional data again. And then lastly, I want to talk about propensity score matching. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this again because Andre is just given a learning lunch on this as well. Um, but the main idea is that for things like the individual treatment effect, the ITE, we actually require the counterfactual data, like I've said before. We, uh, and a particular individual is assigned to either the control group or the uh, treatment group. So we will have one set of factual data and one set of counterfactual data. And the idea of propensity score matching is simply to find proxies of the counterfactual data by looking at similar individuals within their own data. And there's really only two main steps to this. The first one is to compute what's called propensity scores for each data point. And these are computed by solving a classification task between the covariates and the treatment by a simple logistic regression in random forest or whatever you want. And physically, those propensity scores are simply the probability that a certain role in the data set has been assigned a treatment as compared to not being assigned a treatment. And the second step then is to cluster these propensity scores and found, find counterfactual matches for each data point. That means we compute a propensity score for a data point. We look at the closest neighbor that has the opposite treatment value. So if I have a particular data point that's been assigned to the treatment group, I'm going to look at the closest neighbor that was assigned to the control group. So that's going to create pairs of data points that have similar covariance, but opposite treatment values. And if that's given, we can just use those pairs um, using the counterfactual data as proxy for what would have been the actual interventional data. And that allows us to compute the ITE kind of for each row in the data set. And if you then want to compute the average treatment effect, you simply take the average over all of the ITEs in the data set and you get the same one. Right. And that was it for the estimation method so far. I'm going to um, quickly give a give a summary, and then we can um, open the board to questions. And I'm sure there will be some. I first talked about uh, randomized control files, which are currently the gold standard, really, in industry to estimate causal effects. But I've also talked about the fact that they can be quite expensive, dangerous, um, perhaps unethical, or sometimes even lethal and a more uh, ubiquitous or uh, cheaper alternative really to this are observation studies. And we've also gone into the detail about how observation studies are different to interventional ones. And then I've introduced a variety of different treatment effects that allow us to quantify the causal effect of interventions. And I've also talked about the do operator that signifies forming an intervention and removing all causal drivers. And then I've introduced um, the most common treatment effects, the ATE, the CATE, the HTE, and the ITE. And then I've talked about how to actually estimate those treatment effects from observational studies, so from observational data only. I've talked about the backdoor criterion and the frontdoor criterion, and also briefly about double machine learning. I've talked about um, instrumental variables and also about propensity score matching. Now, there are some open questions and causal effect estimation. These are kind of my own collection of what I believe to be important open questions. Uh, if you have anything on this list that you, uh, or if there's anything not on the list that you should think should be included, let me know. Um, first of all, I think disentangling the effects of multiple interventions at the same time 
is mm -hmm. quite important, but I don't think has really been done yet in literature. The research 45 paper about it. Yeah, yeah, I know the person well before it, yeah. actually. Um, the, the idea is that only for linear and Gaussian data you can disentangle what they say that without assumption you can do that basically you can solve it. exactly exactly so the, so the idea is what kind of assumptions do you need to do in order to uh, solve that uh, effectively um then secondly actually accurate individual treatment effect estimation using generative counterfactual errors so propensity score matching looked into the data you already have at hand to find proxies for the counterfactual data but there are also other approaches that, for instance, use generative adversarial networks or other generative models to generate that counterfactual data um, by not looking within the old form data, so some kind of out-of-sample counterfactual data generation. And then I also think it's important to do cause-effect estimation for generally nonlinear relationships. So mm -hmm. I've talked about how many of these approaches assume linearity between treatment and outcome. That's something you can get around by looking at kernel-based methods and other uh, fancy extensions, but it's generally quite hard to do, actually. And um, what's even harder is to actually do this cause and effect estimation for high-dimensional covariate data. So um, not even talking about um, vector covariate data, but also things like images and, and text-based covariate data, which is really hard uh, to deal with. So I don't think there's been much in that space at all. And um, also what I think to be really important is cause and effect estimation using a structural causal model that was actually learned using double machine learning. And you will hear more about that at some other point. Cool. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's my list of open questions. If you have anything uh, else to add, please do let me know. And then at the very end, I have some of them typical reading list that you probably are aware of in terms of high level reading. If you haven't read the book of why, um, just do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> or, try, or try to do it at least. At least in terms of, if you're interested in cause effect estimation, um, Judea Po has some excellent explanations of the front door and back door criterion. He actually formalized the idea of the front door criterion. So his examples in that topic are actually quite excellent. Um, in terms of more technical introductions, um, have a look at the lecture series by Brady Neal, which does have an, mm -hmm. uh, a really good introduction that's easy to understand as well. And if you're more into hardcore statistics, have a look at the books by Shirkov, Janssen, and uh, Spets. Uh, those are um, those are good reads, but they're they're hard to get through. But they're very comprehensive. So if you really want to dig into the mass and, and the research, that's it. that's the books for you. Um, that's it for me. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for presenting. Thank you. Great. Question.